uh, abiding in the shadow of the Almighty. And uh, th- we have covered f- five sessions. Today is the sixth session, the last one. And today I'm going to speak on the amazing blessings of being in the shadow of his wings, of shadow of the Almighty, under his wings. You know, there was a point of time the Lord told the Jews in Luke 13, 34, O Jerusalem, you killed the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers sticks under her wings, but you are not willing. How often, meaning how many times I wanted you to come under my wings, every time you refused. It's not the one-time invitation. How often I long to gather your children, to, uh, your children together under my wings, but you are not willing. Again, again, God is speaking to them. They didn't want to come under his protection. But what a joy it is to realize that under his wings we'll find refuge. And what are the blessings of, in this world itself, of abiding in the shadow of the Almighty God. Of course, every promise which is specified in Psalm 91 is for us. In fact, for every Christian it is, because the blessings are given to us because we belong to Jesus. But to have confidence of those blessings being uh, applicable to us, relevant to us, we need to be close to God, especially protection. In Psalm 91, verse 14, 15, 16, the Lord says, Because he loves me, I will rescue him. I will protect him because he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is about people in the Old Testament who were very close to God. Today, because... We belong to Jesus. All those promises are our inheritance. We can know the promises. But to have confidence of promise being fulfilled in our lives, it will be very good for us to be always close to God and realize that because we love him, he will rescue us when we get into troubles. Otherwise, because we call upon his name, he protects us. Protection is in the name of Jesus. There's a point of time when the Lord prayed to the Father in heaven. John 17, chapter, verse 11, he says, Protect them by the power of your name. The name you gave me, that name is Jesus. Because of acknowledge his name, he protects us. You know, in the, in the context of the COVID, the pandemic for the last two years, I remember the very first message I said before the pandemic became really serious, Sometime in uh, May of March of 2021, and uh, the topic was uh, why Lord, why this pandemic, the COVID, and I remember sharing from Psalm 91, 14, 15, 16, how because we call upon the name of Jesus, His protection is name, He protect us from the virus. Some people get the virus. But because they love God, he will rescue them from the virus. Many have been rescued. There are some people who pass on, who leave this world and go away. Because of COVID, it happened. Many of my friends have gone away. But for such people, it's the ultimate healing. Because Isaiah 53, 5, it says, By his wounds, stripes, we are healed. That word healing is rafa. Rafa means made whole, made complete. We are actually complete only when you are one with him. So going to heaven is completeness. It is ultimate healing. So nothing to worry for us. So I come to the next point. Apart from knowing every good promise of God will be fulfilled in our lives, which he has spoken to us, when we are abiding in the shadow of the Almighty, we will not have any unhealthy fears. No question of fears. Because... Closeness to God means you know God is for you. You are abiding in Him. We abide in Him through obedience. Sustain intimacy with God is realized when we have sustained obedience. One condition for sustained intimacy with God is always pleasing Him. Like Enoch, 
he walked with God 300 years. How do you walk with God? By faith. 11th chapter of Hebrews, verse 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken from his life. He didn't experience death because God took him away. And before he was taken, he was commended as one to please God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So as we walk closely with him, always pleasing him, we will be close to God, always abiding in his shadow. And what happens is, you know God is for you. Many verses in the Bible, in the New Testament especially, talk about being in Christ, in him, abiding in him, remain in me, abide in me, the Lord says. The practical expression abiding in him is obedience. 1 John 3.24 It's written there. Those who obey his commandments live in him and he in them. This is how we know he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. His spirit lives in us forever. And when we abide in him by obedience, we remain in him. And also by remaining in him, we remain in his love, meaning confident of his love. In John chapter 15, 9, 10, 11, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. If you obey my Father's commandments, you will remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments, you remain in my love. I have told you this, that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. So we remain in this love through obedience. All comes back to plain, simple obedience to the teachings of Jesus. So now, when we are walking with him, we remain in his love. Being confident of God's love will result in no fear in us. Because God's love is perfect love. 1 John 4.18 says, Perfect love drives out fear. The one in fear is not made perfect in love. Fear has to do with punishment. Fear has to do with punishment. There's no punishment for us. On the cross, he took away punishment, gave us peace. There's no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So one of the measures of intimacy, which I did not mention the last time, was when you have fears. When you have fears, unhealthy fears, is a sign we are drifting away. Whereas constant intimate closeness to God will drive away every unhealthy fear. We'll have only one fear, a reverent fear of God, reverential obedience. We obey God out of respect and love and reverence. The Bible talks about how the prayers of these were answered. In Hebrews 5.7, the Lord's prayers were heard because of his reverent submission. Reverently submitting to the will of the Father. So when we are closely walking with God, we will not have any unhealthy fears. Only a reverent fear of God, a healthy fear. And that fear of God will inspire us to obey Him. Inspire us to fear Him. The Lord spoke about how He inspires us to fear Him. So the Word of God he motivates us to have a reverent fear of Him. In that process, there is no unhealthy fear, especially fear of man. It's a big trap. Fear of man will be a snare for us. Proverbs 29, 25. Now, when we are close to God consistently, we know God is for us. We never doubt God being for us. He lives in us, but then sometimes we doubt that. He's in us, with us, and for us. And, and Romans chapter 8, verse 31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, 
That's a big if there. That if will not be there if you're walking with God. Because you know God is for you. You are, you are with God anyway. You are, every day is having fellowship with Him. You will never doubt God is for you. And we know He's for you. Who can be against us? Nothing can happen to us. Because God protects us. And therefore, He's a faithful God. As well as 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3 says, chapter 3, verse 3, God is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So the amazing fruits of intimacy with God includes conference of his protection, conference of his promise being put in our lives, and freedom from all anxiety and fear. Because you know for 100%, you should know for sure that God is for you. He loves you so much, he shed blood for you on the cross, purchased you by his blood, and you belong to him. He's a heavenly father, and he's given us angels in charge of us to take care of us. In Psalm 34, verse 7, it says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. The angel of God encamps around those who fear him. Fear him is a reverent fear of God, and he delivers. In fact, God himself surrounds us. Psalm 125, verse 1 and 2. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but it endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. What an amazing confidence there is for us to know that because we are close to him, constantly enjoying his presence, we are his children, and therefore, no anxiety, no fear for us. Because God has the best plans for us. And nothing can shake his plans. Proverbs 21.30 says, There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. The next fruit of Abiding in shadow is, which I often shared before with you, which is also related to freedom from fear, is freedom from discouragement. Because the Holy Spirit who lives in us, with whom actually we are called to have fellowship, he is an eternal encourager. In 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, 16, 17, Paul writes, May Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your heart and strengthen you every good deed and word. Encourage your heart and strengthen every good deed and word. By his grace, he has given us eternal encouragement. That means throughout our lives, from the time we accept the Lord, Eternally, we can be encouraged. Anyway, in heaven, there's no question of discouragement. There's no question of discouragement. No wild thing will ever enter there. But while living in this world, we sometimes tend to get discouraged when you look at circumstances, look at things around us, and wonder what's going to happen to us, considering the situation around us. And therefore, circumstances, you look at negative circumstances, and we meditate upon that, focus on that, can cause us to get discouraged. Whereas when you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, who is an eternal encourager, we will never get discouraged. Because he never changes. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, I, the Lord, do not change. And the Holy Spirit is as much God as God the Father and God the Son. He is a parakletos. Parakletos means encourager. Parakalio means encouraging. Paraklesis means encouragement. They are all related, these words in Greek. So the parakletos, the encourager, always encourages that we have eternal encouragement. 
Can you imagine from the time we accept Christ as Savior of Lord, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. And in fact, we are all called to have fellowship with Him. It's a benediction we often hear from the churches. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. So God wants us to choose to have fellowship with the Spirit. It's up to us to have or not. He is always inside us. I very often share this with you. I was always amazed by the fact that the tent of meeting when Moses would talk to God. Whenever Moses went to the tent of meeting, a pillar of cloud came upon their place, signifying God's presence. Whenever Moses went, a pillar of cloud came. Not the other way around. The pillar of cloud came, Moses went. Anytime Moses wanted to talk to God, God is ready. So we can anytime talk to God. In a lighter vein, I chat with people about the telephone numbers of God. In a lighter vein, telephone numbers, which are never busy. 333, Jeremiah 33.3. Call unto me, I will answer you. I will show you great, great answer to believe you do not know. 9115, Psalm 91, verse 15. He will call upon me, I will answer him, God says. 5115, Psalm 51, verse 15. He will call upon me and I will answer. Same thing. All three verses. 5115, 9115, 333. These numbers are never busy. Anytime, anywhere, we can talk to God. And He wants us to have fellowship with Him because this relationship is based on love. And when you listen to Him, He'll always encourage us. He'll always bless us. This morning we speak in a church, in my own church is speaking, on the topic of blessed to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. The Lord told Abraham, I'll make a great name, I'll make a name great, I'll bless you. I'll make a great nation and you'll be a blessing. Nation will be blessed through you. I'll bless you, you'll be a blessing. And that condition, that promise was to Abraham. For the Israelites, it was conditional promise, blessings. Whereas for you and me, unconditional. You know why? Because of Christ. John 1.16 From the fullness of his grace, we receive blessing after blessing. Blessing means to speak well of and to do good, to do, to speak good and do good. In fact, after God made man, Adam and Eve, what was the first thing he did? The first thing he did was to bless them. After creating them, God blessed them. Genesis 128. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, grow the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living creature moves on the earth. He blessed them. Blessing means to speak well of somebody, to speak good and to do good. As simple as, very simple English it is. To speak good and do good. That is a blessing. To bless people. We are blessed by God because He always speaks well of us. Word of God always builds us up. He always does what is good for us. Now when you're close to God, we be confident of that. We will know whenever he speaks, always to build us up. There's a point of time when the prophet Micah was prophesying in Israel, northern kingdom of Israel, and he was saying things which are very difficult for them to take, but good for them because there was correction, he was rebuking them for wrongdoings. But they're wondering and asking this question Will God speak like this? Is the Spirit of God angry? Will he speak like this, the way Micah spoke to them? And the Lord tells them, how can you say, O Israel, will God do such thing? Will he speak like this? Is he angry? Micah 2.7 Do not my words do good to him whose ways are upright. God's word always does good. And the Holy Spirit will take the scriptures today 
and teach us and always risk for exhortation, strengthening and comfort. 1 Corinthians 14 chapter verse 3. Prophecy about strengthening, exhortation and comfort, encouragement. Comfort and encouragement are basically the same. Parakalio or paraklesis. So when we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit in a consistent way, we will always be encouraged because he's an encourager. He'll never change and become a discourager. He's always an encourager. And in the Bible, whenever people of God tended to get discouraged, there was a reason for it. They forgot God. Take the psalmist in Psalm 42. Psalmist is Korah. Why do downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For I praise you, my Savior, my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you, O Lord. I will remember you. When you always remember the Lord, not that not remember the Lord, have fellowship with Him. Believe me, you'll never get discouraged. There are times when a mind gets bombarded by all kinds of thoughts, looking at circumstances, listening to what people say about you. Then you take it to heart and why you people talk like this? Why are they saying like this about me? And you focus on unwanted talk, on gossip, slander, backbiting, malicious talk. You focus on that. Forget about it. Ecclesiastes 7, 21 and 22. Don't patient every word people say about you. Or you may say, here a servant curse you. On the other hand, we pay all attention to God's word which comes from the Holy Spirit. And what happens is that word in us will become like fire. Remember the time the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1920. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Don't read prophecy the contempt. Test everything. Hold on to what is good. He says, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Some Bible said, don't quench the Holy Spirit. How do people put out the Spirit's fire? Spirit's fire, fire of the Holy Spirit. How do they put it off? How do they quench it? Prophecy is hearing from God and speaking, hearing from the Holy Spirit speaking. When someone prophesies, don't deal with contempt. Don't go by the messenger. Oh, how could this man prophesy? He is not a great man of God. There are no great men of God today. Only men of a great God or women of a great God. Go by the content. It's in the Holy Spirit and you put it away, negate it. You are putting out the Spirit's fire. Because the word of God is the fire of the spirit. At the same time, you don't accept everything a person says. Test everything. Next verse says, test everything. Hold on to what is good. So while it seems very, very difficult to believe, it's actually possible for all of us to be encouraged at all times. Because by his grace, he has given us eternal encouragement. Discouraging thoughts come to everybody. Anxious thoughts come to everybody. All the unwanted thoughts come to everybody. But don't entertain those thoughts. Today, God is in the business of writing His word in our hearts and minds. In a morning Bible study, we're doing the book of Hebrews. We just did last week on the book of Hebrews, 8th chapter. We're now going to 9th chapter. 8th chapter, verse 10, the writer talks about. How the Old Testament prophecy in Jeremiah 31, 33, 34 is fulfilled today. In those days, God said, this is the covenant I make with them at that time. I'll put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. That's fulfilled today. Because the new covenant, New Testament, covenant means the Greek word for covenant is actually Deaketan, Deaketan, it means testament. That's the Old Testament, New Testament. Old covenant, New covenant. Today, God wants to write his word in our hearts and minds. 
and his word always encourages. Romans 15 4 says, For everything written in the past was written to teach us. So that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we will have a hope. Scriptures encourage us, Old Testament and New Testament. And even when God, in fact, corrects us also, in such a loving way, He corrects. Romans 2 4, that 4 says, says, Romans 2 4, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. Not the stick of God, not the hammer of God. God never hammers us like that. The kindness of God. And therefore, let's take to heart whatever God speaks to us. And there are so many blessings of this intimacy with God. Also, confidence of our prayers being heard. When you walk intimately with the Lord, when you walk in reverent obedience, we know He's heard our prayers. I can, going back to Jesus' words, Jesus' prayers, he offered prayers and petitions, loud prayers and tears. He was heard because of his reverent submission. Hebrews 5 7. When we reverently submit to the will of God, we know our prayers are heard. Do anybody walk in closely with them? Talk to me, hear from him. The moment you go here and there, he will, he will immediately correct us. He'll keep our path straight. In 1 Samuel 2 9, Hannah says, He guards the feet of his saints. He guards our feet. He makes sure our, step, our footsteps are on the right path. If we go right or left, he'll bring us back. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 21, God says to his people, you turn right or left, you hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way you walk in it. Today that voice is not behind us, it's inside us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. He is a counselor. Every step we will counsel us. You know how much of, how little teaching there is today in churches today about the Holy Spirit. He is the one we are supposed to have fellowship with him. He lives in us. How many Christians today realize that the Lord is in them? How many are confident that their bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? And therefore, at least let us, let us know for sure. You have heard so many messages on this for the last two years. Many of you have been attending. Please remember from the time you accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, His Spirit remains in you. He is an encourager, the author of the Bible, and the Bible itself encourages us. So we have so many resources by which you can be encouraged. And, when you, and that will motivate us to walk with God, to obey Him. And when we obey Him, we'll have confidence of our prayers being heard. The Lord Jesus Christ always knew his prayer was heard. Once he prayed to the Father in front of the uh, disciples. We often did that, but one particular incident I want to refer to. At the tomb of Lazarus, a lot of people had come there, Jews had come there, unbelievers had come there, plus there were people who were his followers. There was a dead body lying, and he prayed. John 11, 41, 42, 43. You know what he says? I thank you, Father, you heard me. I knew you always hear me. But I say this for the benefit of those standing here. They may believe you sent me. That's all. And then he says, Lazarus, a dead Lazarus. Lazarus, come out. Some of Lazarus heard and came out of the tomb. Two sentences to God the Father. I knew you always hear me. That's because Jesus walked reverently before the Father in step with the Father's will, did nothing on his own, spoke nothing on his own. John 5, 19 says, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does. Everything he spoke came from the Father. In, in John 12, 50, he says, John 12, 15, whatever I say is what the Father has told me to say. And you and me are called to be like that. What we speak must be coming from him, our fellowship with him, intimacy with him. And therefore, 
when we walk in step with the spirit of god and we pray led by the spirit we will have confidence of prayers being heard and answered at the right time why do people keep on ask everyone to pray for them some personal need they've got when the third things concerning all of us like evangelism revival in the churches god raised many people to serve him we all pray we, as a body of christ we pray a personal prayer request god knows our needs when he pray he hears he loves to hear our prayer what do you want to tell the whole world pray for me pray for me pray for me if it's concerning ministry concerning the things that affect the whole church yes by all means we pray together as i prayed for boldness in the first century but personal needs god will take care even if god asking he will do and that confidence we will have when you're close to god intimate day walking with god you know he hear heard heard a prayer psalm 37 verse 4 delight yourself in the lord take the desires of your heart when abiding in the lord what is about in the lord in the lord means in christ abiding in the shadow of the almighty that is in the lord in christ in him abiding in him and then you delight yourself as to who you are in christ what happens he will give us desires of our heart even without asking he will give he knows our needs and he gives because he loves us he loves to do good to us again one more old testament prophecy which i very often quote you must be I heard I heard it many times by now again to jeremiah jeremiah 32nd chapter 38 to 41 god says they will be my people and i will be their god i will give them singleness of heart and action they always fear me for their good for the good of the children after them i will make an everlasting covenant with them i will never stop doing good to them and i will inspire them to fear me they never turn away from me i will rejoice in doing them good i will never stop doing good to them i'll inspire them to fear me i will rejoice in doing good to them that prophecy for new testament believers and the same thing is quoted by the apostle paul in second corinthians 6 chapter last verse this talks about don't yoke on believers then he goes on to say god says they be my people i'll be their god seventh verse seventh chapter verse one begins by saying since we have these promises what promise god says I will be their God. They will be my people. He's quoting the same Old Testament Jeremiah's prophecy. Because we have these promises, he says, "Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God." So, another amazing fruit of closeness to God is confidence in our prayers being heard. and will be answered at the right time till then we keep thanking god for prayers being answered at the right time another amazing uh, fruit of closeness to god is confidence of promises being fulfilled what god has spoken to us he will fulfill at the right time one is prayer being answered confidence other is promise he spoken to you he will fulfill it Because God is not a man that he should lie; he won't change his mind. When it comes to doing good, he will not change his mind. But then, after God has spoken to us about anything, some particular matter, He's given us a promise. We hold on to the promise by faith. Now, how do we inherit the promise? Two things: faith and patience. Hebrews six twelve says, "Through faith and patience, we inherit the promise of." Abraham was a man of faith but in one area he was not patient God spoke to him about having a son he told him I'm going to give you children like Sarah and Enos and just through Isaac supposed to have children but then before Isaac was born God told him I'm going to give you a son a child of promise he was not patient he was hurry That's why when the Hagar and Ishmael was born, we learn from that. 
We learned from what people did right and what people did wrong. Of course, God gave uh, through Isaac, gave him Isaac, and through Isaac, offspring reckoned. He said, God said, but he had to patiently wait for the right time. Faith and patience. Many people have faith but no patience, and therefore, let's understand: if God has spoken something to us, it will happen. He will not change his mind. Numbers twenty-three nineteen. Balaam tells to King Balak, "Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfil?" The context is, King Balak of Moab had tried to bribe Balaam to put a curse on the Israelites, tried to offer him money, and Balaam every time opened his mouth became a blessing. And Balak says, "I told him curse them. How come you blessing them? He says, I can't change." God give me command to bless. I bless. I can't change it. God won't change his mind. When it comes to blessing people, he will not change his mind. When it comes to punishment, we repent. He will change his mind. That's the beauty of our God. So he tells Balak, "Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfil? I've been given a command to bless. <clears throat> I have blessed. I can't change it. Period." Then God Himself says, Isaiah. Forty-three, thirteen. When I act, who can reverse it? So when God has spoken to us, in time He will do it. So wait, patiently wait, and please remember, every aspect of our lives He is concerned about. There is no question of small request, big request. Small prayer, big prayer. Small testimony, big testimony. Some people say, "But I have a small testimony." Testimony is testimony. Is about what God did in your life. Every aspect of life is concerned about. Nothing is too small to ask God to talk to God about. He's a heavenly Father, loving God. Be very free with Him. Be transparent. That's the key of intimacy with God. You can tell Him anything. Anything you can tell Him. But the reverence, intimacy with God, shouldn't be taken to mean familiarity with God. Don't be familiar with God. Intimacy with God means reverence also. Like for example, Levi. God made a very special covenant with Levi. Malachi chapter two, five to seven. My covenant is a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence. He revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in mouth. Nothing falls down upon his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. Another man who walked with God in peace and uprightness, and turned many from sin. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, and from his mouth men should seek instruction, because he mentions the Lord Almighty. As a beautiful passage, Micah two five to seven. I later on will meditate upon that. After today's session, please meditate upon this passage. How. Levi walked with God in peace and uprightness, and he revered God. So walking with God means revering Him, not be familiarity. You can't fight with God. There's some people say I fight with God. How can you fight with God? Who is God? Who are we? Awesome God He is. We revere Him, walk with Him intimately. As Levi walked with Him intimately, and he turned many from sin. When you walk with God closely, our life will be so infectious in terms of peace and joy. People want to be like us. God will draw them to us. Abba Ishaad Almighty means we manifest the peace and joy of the Lord, because obedience means we manifest peace and joy. And without our trying to show off, trying to project ourselves, God will make them understand. There's something in us they need to have. That is Christ. They won't, they won't be able to identify it. something about you. I want. To, I've learned something about you in you that I want to emulate. They won't know what it is. It's actually the Holy Spirit living inside us, and the peace and joy we've got. So God wants to use us as we walk with God closely. That closeness to be manifest to people. They'll come to us and want to know how come we are who we are. 
The Apostle Paul spoke about how God is pleased to reveal Christ in him to others. So God is pleased to reveal Christ in Paul towards others. In Galatians chapter 1, from verse 15, he writes, When God who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me. The my picture among the I didn't consult any man. He said, God is pleased to reveal his son in me. Paul knew that Christ lives in him. You know, for, fully, for, for sure. That's why it says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. So when you walk intimately with the Lord, so many blessings of that intimacy. And I do really hope all of us have been watching and listening in sessions, six sessions, be motivated to have a passion to say, Lord, I want to walk with you. No one was. I will walk with you. Help me walk with you. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, Amos 3, 3, can two walk together unless they agree to do so? You can't walk together unless they agree to walk. God wants to walk with us because his word reveals it. James 4, 8, rock close to God, God will rock close to you. But we need to tell God, Lord, I want to walk with you. We have to articulate our desire. You know, God wants us to articulate. You know, you remember the time when Jesus asked the blind man, what do, you want, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do? Some people say, stupid question. He was a man who can heal blind people. He's asking, what do you want me to do for you? Why did Jesus ask that question? He wanted that man to say, I want to see. I want to see. So the leading question, what do you want me to do for you? I want to see. So God wants us to tell him what he want to do for him. If you want to walk with God, tell him, Lord, I want to walk with you. Remain in your shadow always, Lord. Moment I tend to drift away, Lord, bring me back, Lord. Bring me back to a close walk with you. And it's possible for all of us. Every Christian's God to walk closely with him. I told you amazing blessings, confidence of protection, no anxiety, no fear, no discouragement. Confidence in prayer, confidence in promise being fulfilled, and the fact that people may be against us, we will not have a fear of people, but you know, God is for us. So many blessings. And let's therefore today make a commitment. Last session on this topic, I want to close in prayer.